difficulties back in the booth. So we will be starting in, in one minute. Me and um, Martha broke the camera. Oh, and here we are. <laughs> Less than a minute. My name is Martha Cole. I'm a historical specialist here at the Montana Historical Society, and I'm happy to welcome you to the sixth of our series, Montana History in Nine More Easy Lessons. Copper, Commies, and the Cold War, Montana's Labor Resurgence. Uh, last year's talks, uh, this is the second series. We did it last year. That's why this is nine more easy lessons. Uh, last year's talks and the first five talks are all available for your viewing pleasure on YouTube, if you missed those. And because we are also recording this talk for YouTube, we're going to ask everyone to save their questions for the end. Um, it's my honor to introduce our speaker, uh, Senior Archivist Rich Arstad, joined the staff of the Montana Historical Society in 2001 after completing his master's degree at the University of Montana, where he wrote his thesis on the 1917 IWW timber strike in the Kootenai Valley. He's the author of Western Montana's Christmas Tree Boom, uh, published in Montana, the magazine of Western history, and co-author of the book, Montana Place Names from Alzada to Zortman. He's a prolific public speaker who's presented on topics ranging from Lewis and Clark and World War I to jerks in Montana history. He's also a staunch unionist, wonderful colleague, doting dog owner, and all around great guy. So please help me welcome Rich Arstead. <laughs> Doting dog lover, wow. That's, that's kind of true. Um, well, first and foremost, if you go back to YouTube to watch this again, you need to watch Game of Thrones instead. <laughs> and it's, there's, there's no dragons here. So, well, maybe, but we'll get into that. Um, everybody hear me okay? All right, I'll try not to fidget too bad. I've, Martha informs me that I have just exactly 50 minutes, and I have a 34-page outline but I have faith. Uh, so um, it was kind of interesting how this came about because 1934 forward is kind of out of my wheelhouse when it comes to Montana history and Montana labor history. So when Martha approached me about doing this, it was like, yeah, sure, that would be good to get outside my wheelhouse, right? I didn't realize it was going to consume the next six weeks of my wheelhouse, but it did. Um, Typically, I dabble uh, in uh, Montana's labor history from the 1890s up through uh, the 1920s. So, um, and in order to kind of get a grasp of what happens in this 1934 to 1950-ish period, and I'm going to call it the 50-ish period because I actually go to about 1956, and it was hard stopping there. Um, I have to lay a little groundwork um, for what happened beforehand. So... 1870s through the 1920s, uh, the United States as a whole saw the industrialization of the country, uh, saw this huge influx of immigrant labor, um, and the, I don't want to say decline of craftsmanship, but we became assembly line workers and so forth, which didn't require skilled workers. And so as a result, we had this, if you will, unwashed mass of workers who traveled from industrial job to industrial job if they could, especially in the West. And Montana was no different. Uh, Montana's labor history actually starts really early. Uh, it does not start in Butte. Who's from Butte? A few. It, sorry. <laughs> Helena actually gets the nod for that. 1866, the first union was established in the territory of Montana when the uh, Newspaper typographical union uh, was created here. First strike was carried out by the typographical union as well in Virginia City in 1867 and 68. So Butte's kind of a late comer to the show. Uh, just, I can't wait to give this presentation in Butte. I should get stoned off the stage. But typically we consider Butte the birthplace of organized labor in Montana because it was one of the, well, it was it would call itself the city on the hill when it comes to unionism. Um, 
and it began in 1878 when uh, the Butte miners went on strike at the Alice and Lexington mines because those two companies cut the wages for the unskilled workers, and they won the strike, and they realized that, hey, maybe they had something that was worth uh, pursuing here in this whole organizing business, so they did. They established the Butte Working Men's Union, which accepted anybody and everybody. It didn't matter if you worked underground, above ground, uh, in a bakery, uh, in a restaurant, whatever. Anybody could belong. And it was that way for several years. Uh, Butte was also one of those places that wasn't focused at that time and primarily organizing along a craft basis. I mean, they would organize anybody. But the real, what I believe is the legend of the Gibraltar of unionism, uh, didn't really kick off, as far as I'm concerned, until the 1890s. And in 1893, uh, or in the 1890s, you had several events occur um, that really solidified Butte's uh, hold in the West as a Union stronghold. You had the 1893 formation of the Western Federation of Miners, with Butte uh, being uh, local number one of uh, the WFM. Uh, and in 1895, you had the creation of the Montana Federation of Labor, what we call the Montana AFL-CIO today. And you also saw those two organizations combine in 1898 to create the Western slash American Labor Union. And the sole purpose of that organization was to organize unskilled workers. And it came about through the State Federation and the Western Federation of Miners because of those industries, specifically the timber industry, that were secondary to mining. And so that's primarily what the Western, uh, the Western Labor Union, which later became the American Labor Union, focused on was organizing the timber industry in Montana. And they had some success at that. As a matter of fact, here recently we took in an accession for an 1899 Western Labor Union card from St. Regis, Montana. It's pretty cool. Um, and then in 1905, you have the Western Federation of Miners going to Chicago and help creating the Industrial Workers of the World, which was the boogeyman of organized labor um, in the first couple of decades of the 20th century. Uh, so Butte was off to a good start. Montana itself was off uh, to a good start in terms of organized labor. And then that all starts to come unraveled about 1914, uh, when the Butte miners decide that their union has gotten too conservative and they blow up their own union hall, which, what else do you do, y you know? Um, it worked, unfortunately it worked a little too well. Um, it didn't quite end the Western Federation of Miner. It did end the closed shop era in Butte, where they only had to hire um, union uh, men, uh, individuals that belong to the union. The Western Federation of Miners actually hung on in Montana um, after uh, 1914 and through World War I and actually into the 1930s as well uh, without Butte, so they managed to survive. But things were difficult. And then, of course, during World War I, you had the, uh, I always forget to change the slides, you have the crackdown on organized labor uh, as a whole. Um, in part because of the fact that most of these industrial workers were foreign-born or they were the children of foreign-born parents. Uh, and anybody that uh, promoted a strike activity or increase in wages and those types of things, safety, um, safety issues and so forth, was considered unpatriotic after the United States got into the war. That didn't mean organizing stopped, um, especially after the war. The American Federation of Teachers, which was actually created in 1916, had a brief local at the University of Montana, Local 120. Uh, the charter is there in the center, uh, and there's a little snippet from the uh, uh, Missoulian, um, well, actually it was from the Helena newspaper, uh, from the Missoulian about the newest university, or the newest union at, uh, in Montana, and wondering if they were all Bolsheviks which feeds in nicely to, you know, the heart of this whole story. Commies, Cold War, and copper, uh, and so forth. So organizing wasn't dead, but it was certainly injured. Um, things like the Montana Council of Defense, uh, loyalty leagues, uh, the American plan uh, were all geared towards getting control of the labor situation in the United States. And the interesting thing is during this 1920s, 
um, you had what they were calling welfare capitalism. In essence, the corporations were taking on the role of the organizer, and they were organizing company unions. So what they would do is they would increase wages and benefits um, just enough to keep folks happy and on an even keel. They even, in some instances, created their own company unions. Uh, the federal government got into that uh, in 1918 and into the 1920s with their loyal legion of loggers and lumbermen, uh, the 4L, uh, which tried to organize the timber industry and keep it on an even, an even keel. Um, and so as a result of these uh, various oppositions to the labor movement, you saw about a 28% drop in union membership uh, during this time period. Uh, so it wasn't, quite, it wasn't quite knocked out, but it was certainly on the ropes. And then to compound things, you had uh, instances like uh, the assassination attempt on A. Mitchell Palmer, who was the Attorney General of the United States in the Wilson administration in 1919, by an anarchist, which, you know, it's what anarchists do. Um, and so he unleashed what were called the Palmer Raids, where they were going to ro round up all the aliens and the anarchists and the communists and so forth and ship them back to Russia. And so this is kind of, well, this is the, the first Red Scare, I guess, if you will. Um, and it also launched the career of a, a young G-man by the name of J. Edgar Hoover. Uh, and what they did was they rounded up all these individuals like Emma Goldman, and uh, put him on a ship and pointed it towards Russia. Um, there was this deep-seated fear. I get uh, well, yeah, fears. That's about the only fear is about the only way you can call it of this kind of foreign influence on American labor. And so, socialism and communism and anarchism were things that came up early and often. Anybody here um, ever watch the HBO series Newsroom? with Jeff Daniels, he's got a couple. He's got this great scene at the beginning where it's, it's, it's post 9-11 and he's talking about how the United States used to be before 9-11 and where they weren't so afraid of everything. Well, after doing this and working on this for the last six weeks, I would say that we've been scared pretty much the entire time. It just depends on what the level of what the fear factor is. There we go. We'll get a, a punchline in for the fear factor. So <coughs> uh, things got really dicey for organized labor at this time. And there were several significant strikes at this, it, during this time period as well. The coal miners went out on strike. And so about a quarter of the working population of the country was also on strike in the 1920s. So they really cracked down hard on them. Uh, and essentially, they used patriotism uh, to do it. Uh, Frederick Lewis Allen, a historian at the time, I think probably stated it be, uh, best. He said in, in, innumerable other gentlemen now discovered that they could defeat whatever they wanted to defeat by tarring it conspicuously with the Bolshevist brush, which is kind of a cool way of saying they wrapped themselves in old glory and, and claimed that they were descend all direct descendants of the founding fathers and anybody who opposed any idea that they had obviously was on the side of Trotsky and Lenin. So um, it kind of sets the table a little bit for what's going on. Um, that's the appetizer, I guess, if you will. This is what the main course is going to look like, more or less. Uh, I passed out a labor history timeline that I've been working on for a long time, um, just for you to kind of glance through. Uh, and um, it's about as inclusive as I can get it, but it is a timeline, so it changes all the, all the time. So these are some of the things that we're going to be covering in our now 40 minutes or less uh, as we shoot through this. So I, I might, actually have to, uh, might actually have to skip the slide. Mm -hmm. um, and you can't really kick this story off with the whole uh, copper communism and the Cold War without talking about the Western Federation of Miners also known as the International Union of Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers. So the interesting thing is after 1916, the Western Federation of Miners got together and decided that maybe their name was too associated with radicalism and that they should change it up to kind of give themselves a softer, gentler appearance to the public. 
And so at their convention, they named themselves at the time the Union of Mine, Mill, and Smelter Workers. They didn't add the international until a few years later when they picked up a few locals up in Canada and so forth. So Mine Mill is still around. Um, it still exists. Uh, they still have, like I said, a toehold in Montana with Local 117 in Anaconda. The interesting thing about this, too, as I was, as I was working on this, was finding out that despite the fact that the workers in Anaconda were working for the Anaconda Company, they did not support the Butte miners when they went out in 14 or 17 or 20 or any of the times in between. They really weren't unified in that, in, in that manner like you would assume that a, a, a union would be. Um, that, would, that would come later. Um, between 1929 and 1932, uh, the mining industry in Butte saw a drop in miners of about 84%. So they went from around 10,000 miners to about 1,600 during that time frame. So again, unionism was, was pretty much gone in Butte proper, except for the craft unions. Um, like the carpenters and the teamsters and so forth, those were still, those were still uh, hanging around. Mine Mill actually had three locals in Montana at the time before um, the New Deal kicked into play. Uh, they had six total, so Montana had three wow. of the six uh, locals that was keeping Mine Mill alive. There was local 117 in Anaconda. There was local 83 in Butte, which was the Stationary Engineers Union. And then there was Local 16 in Great Falls, the smeltermen up in Great Falls. And again, they were hanging on by a thread, waiting for something to happen, anything to happen, um, that would give them another chance to flourish. And there were a few things that were beginning to occur. There was a, a fair amount of unrest. I took the slide out because I didn't want to get buried into it, but I, a perfect example is what happened with the Bonus Army March on Washington in 1932. And the fact that the detractors of that Bonus Army march labeled them in, as communists and so forth, and that kind of opened the door for the federal government to move in and just take them out. So by the time FDR uh, is elected president, he realizes that he has to do something to kind of settle down this angry mass of unemployed workers out there. And he kicks the New Deal off immediately with the National Industrial Recovery Act which, as you can see, um, helped business uh, establish codes setting prices and minimum wage, uh, put people back to work. It was very much a cooperative deal between employer and employee. And if you played nicely, you got one of these blue eagles, which, although this one's black, so I'm not sure what that means, uh, to hang in your business window. Um, but more importantly, the National Industrial uh, Recovery Act um, had a section that dealt with labor, Section 7A, that stated that the employee had the right to organize and bargain collectively through representatives of their own choosing. They could not be coerced to join a company union, and participating employers had to follow the presidentially approved maximum working hours and minimum rates. Well, this passed in 1933, and the Butte miners saw this as an opportunity. So they actually began org reorganizing the Butte Miners Union in 1933 in, in June. And by July, they had 2,300 members. So you can see folks are reaching for anything that they can for some type of relief uh, from the Depression. The Anaconda Company itself actually recognized uh, the union in January of 1934. So it seems like things might be um, going a little better uh, um, in Anaconda. Unfortunately, they don't go um, that well. Uh, in, 19, in April of 1934, uh, the Butte Miners Union issued their um, contract demands, I guess, if you will, to the company. They wanted a pay increase. Uh, they wanted to end any miner working underground alone. They wanted overtime pay. They wanted a 30-hour work week. They wanted dues checkoff. Uh, dues checkoff essentially means that the company would deduct the union dues from their paycheck before they received their paycheck. That way the union wouldn't have to go around and get their little dues book stamped and so forth. Um, they wanted a wage schedule that included a minimum wage. Uh, 
And they had to hammer this out uh, through the National Recovery Act through um, one of the, uh, the codes that, that was put into place for this. And they were having a hard time negotiating this with the copper industry nationwide. Um, and they just couldn't come up with something that worked for the copper companies and the copper miners. So uh, later in 18, or 1934, the Butte Miners Union took a strike vote, uh, which overwhelmingly passed, 1,513 to 147. Anaconda followed suit, as did the Butte engineers. Uh, Great Falls fell a little short of the two-thirds that they, was necessary for them to walk out on strike, but they, it was pretty evident they had the majority of votes. They just didn't have two-thirds that they supported it. Um, and so when the uh, copper codes failed to meet the demands of the miners, they decided it was time for them to walk out on strike. And so they went out on strike. Butte, Anaconda, Great Falls. That wasn't something that had occurred before um, back in the day when it was referred to as the Gibraltar of unionism. Um, Janet Orr did a great master's thesis on the 1934 strike. Um, it was one of the few pieces that I found written about the 1934 strike. I just assumed that everybody had written about that strike and there was gonna be lots of secondary sources to t tie into that knot. Um, but if you get a chance to get your hands on Janet Orr's uh, thesis, I would encourage you to, uh, to, to uh, take a look at it. Uh, she states that the, that the strike was unique in the history of uh, labor in Butte for several reasons. Uh, at the time, it was the longest strike in Butte's history. Um, the other thing was the surprising level of solidarity because not only did the miners walk, but the engineers, the machinists, the electrical workers, the blacksmiths, the boilermakers, the structural iron workers, the carpenters, the teamsters, the pipe, general pipe fitters, sheet metal workers, and painters. So the crafts walked with the unskilled workers. That hadn't happened before. Well, it did briefly in 1917 when the electricians went with them, but that typically, that type of solidarity was not typical in Butte until that time. So it's pretty amazing what you see. A um, couple of other things that were unique to this instance was that the state, county, and city law enforcement wings decided to stay neutral as much as possible during the strike. So they refused to get involved on one side or the other. And again, that wasn't something that had occurred. Typically, the um, uh, Silver Bowl County uh, Sheriff's Department would come in on the side of the company, as would the Butte City Police, as would the state of Montana with martial law and so forth. But they decided to stay neutral in this instance. Um, and she's got this great quote, there was considerable tension, but no, re but no relatively serious violence. And it's like, okay, so what's not relatively serious violence? Um, Obviously, there were a few people that were beaten up. That just kind of happens during these types of strikes and so forth. But one of the things that I found interesting that I had never heard of before was this, um, this uh, well, they called it terrorism. Um, the miners called it, well, the newspaper, the Montana Standard called it an act of terrorism. The miners called it serenading. So what they would do is they would load up in cars, they would go to the home address of one of the individuals crossing the picket line, affectionately known as a scab, and they would hoot and holler and cuss and throw things and occasionally paint on their garages, you know, nasty comments and those types of things. And again, the newspaper uh, referred to that as, a, as a acts of terrorism. And again, you know, showing that, that demonstrating that, that uh, amount of solidarity, the, the Butte uh, Clerks Union, um, the milkmen, the grocers, and the coal men, those folks that made deliveries and so forth, informed their employers that they would not deliver to scab homes, um, that those individuals had to come into the store and so forth to buy or obtain their own stuff. They wouldn't, they wouldn't make home deliveries. So the newspaper stopped short of openly accusing the strike committee of orchestrating these serenading events and so forth, but they did more than suggest that members of the strike committee participated. And there were also your typical instances of, uh, or, and reports of miners scattering broken glass and nails and so forth in front of the gates of the various mines and things like that to, uh, 
to, uh, to disrupt um, whatever work was going on. Uh, it didn't come out until, oh, about three years later that the Anaconda Company had actually laid in a fairly large stock of what they called tear and sickening gas to use on the, on the strikers if things got out of hand. It didn't, but um, they, they certainly were prepared. There was one instance of a hit and run that I came upon uh, when one of the strike breaker, breakers driving a truck out of uh, the mine um, decided to, well, I don't know if he decided or if the picketer stepped in front of him or whatever. Anyhow, a picketer got hit by the truck. Um, and so that caused the union to get all up in arms about it. Uh, and um, as such, both sides were contacting Governor Cooney about what could be done um, to kind of keep a lid on the situation. Uh, Governor Cooney wasn't a fan of the serenading, so he actually asked the Butte Miners Union to stop doing that. They did. Um, and uh, he also received uh, a petition or petitions, and we, we actually have these. Uh, and this is where I really appreciate Janet Orr's thesis because I'm looking at these petitions and I'm going, wonder how many signatures we have here, because it's a lot of petitions. And then in reading her thesis, it's 2,100. So I didn't have to count. Uh, but 2,100 individuals in Butte signed the petition, sent it to the governor, and said, please do not send the state militia. We don't need them here. We're fine. Just let this play out, and we will get this thing settled. And Cooney himself, um, kind of an accidental governor, I guess, if you will, uh, had a tendency to side with uh, the workers at that time and the miners. And he was at odds with the Anaconda Company over the distribution of relief uh, across the state and how that relief was, was shared out and so forth. So it was kind of interesting th how things unfolded. Um, during this process, and the strike went on four and a half months, uh, Great Falls finally got its act together and they went out on strike as well. In, uh, in, in June. Um, as I mentioned, the craft unions uh, went out on strike uh, with, the, with the miners. The interesting thing about this is that the mine mill, even though it was an umbrella organization, wasn't set up like the craft organizations. Craft unions, are they have their own kind of interesting dynamic. And that came out during this strike because several of the craft unions, their nationals, decided that the strike needed to be settled for their members. So they actually sat down in Washington, D.C. with management and settled the strike for their members without any of the local members being at the table. Uh, okay, I guess if you can do that, you can, you can pull that off. Uh, so... 20 of the 28 striking craft unions in Butte, Anaconda, and Great Falls voted to accept the deal that their nationals made with the company. The eight that held out were the eight craft unions in Butte. Unfortunately, it was a majority vote deal, so when the majority went for the deal that the nationals came up with, the eight were forced to take that as well, and they, they ended up returning to work. Um, the miners and the company eventually uh, settled their differences in September of 1931 or 34 when the majority of the union members voted yes on the new contract, which established the closed shop in Butte. That was probably one of the biggest victories that they got, was it became the Gibraltar once again. You couldn't work on the hill unless you had a union card. Um, <coughs> and... Uh, they got a small wage increase. They didn't get their 30-hour work week and, and so forth. Um, but it was, certainly, it was certainly different than anything that they had experienced in the past. The other interesting thing about this that uh, Janet Orr points out is that the miners were able to stay out as long as they did, in large part because of the relief programs through the New Deal. That wasn't something that they had to, that they could rely on in the past. So being able to be on strike and getting relief at the same time to where they were still able to take care of their families' immediate needs and so forth actually aided and assisted the miners in staying out on strike as long as they did. 
it didn't hurt for the company either that they were in the middle of a depression and copper wasn't really getting um, that big of a market anymore. Uh, it didn't really hurt the company for, to, to, for them to stay out as long as they did either. So a relatively peaceful strike. The interesting thing about this um, for me was the almost, not even really a blip on the radar of the Butte teachers going on strike at the same time. Um, and they began organizing in 1934 as well uh, during, the, uh, during the miners' strike um, and began trying to convince the teachers, their fellow teachers and the public that organizing was a good thing for them because it could lead to better pay for, for, for the teachers. Um, they received assistance from the Central Labor Council and the Butte Trades and Labor Council. Uh, some of these individuals actually served on the school board. So when the teachers were talking about strike, they went and talked to them and they said, you need to go talk to the AFT and organize under the American Federation of Teachers. And so they did. Um, the school board initially refused to recognize the new union. So 43 affiliated unions decided that they were going to boycott the businesses of those school board members in Butte. It took two weeks. And the school board met again and said, you know what, it's a good thing that you have the Butte. Um, teachers Union. Um, so th the BTU 332 uh, came into existence in the midst of this minor strike as well. A couple of interesting things about this. One, they negotiated the first teacher's salary schedule in the country. Not the state, the country. It had never been done before. So that was pretty astonishing. The other thing is, is that it is the well, I guess, I guess you'd have to say that U of M was the first, but the Butte Teachers Union was the first public employees union to really latch on and thrive, and it still exists today. So that was also impressive, kind of an opening of the, of the door of public sector unions. And that was something that, again, that wouldn't occur until past the timeline that Martha gave me. So we won't, we won't get too far into that. Um, a few other interesting things that went on, because, well, one other interesting thing that I want to touch on that, that, that occurred during the same time was uh, the Butte, this public union going to the legislature and lobbying. And in 1937, they did just that. They went to the legislature to lobby on the teacher's retirement system. And the interesting thing about it, uh, at the time, the other half of what would become MEA, MFT, that some of you are familiar with in the current MFPE, the Montana Education Association, was actually an association that was open to anybody and everybody that was edu in education, whether or not you were a superintendent, principal, uh, head, or superintendent of public instruction, whatever. Uh, anyhow, one of the MEA members was there uh, during the legislature uh, um, lobbying on behalf of uh, the retirement system as well. His last name was McGallagher. Uh, he was a principal from the Great, Great Falls. Anyhow, he wrote the superintendent of the Butte schools and said, quote, I have never looked with favor upon a teacher's union. However, I must admit that if teachers, if the teachers at Butte had been able to, turn the page, bring about this effective lobbying, I may change my opinion somewhat. So it's kind of interesting how they immediately begin having an impact uh, on their profession as well, and how that began to spread. Again, because of the limited time, can't get into the fact that Haver and Anaconda and those, uh, several of other those places began forming teachers' unions as well. Um, so the barn door was open, I guess, if you will. And then in 1935, two things happened. One, the Supreme Court declared the National Industrial Recovery Act unconstitutional, so that wiped it off the boards, and Congress and President Roosevelt all signed on to the Labor Relations Act, or the, uh, the uh, Wagner Act. Um, the Wagner Act essentially was like the holy grail for organized labor, and what it did was it codified that Section 7A that was in the, the NRA about the workers having a right to collectively bargain and so forth, and the National Labor Relations Board where they could where, where both sides could go um, to settle disputes, elections, and all that kind of good stuff. 
Um, so it was, it, was, it was quite a boon for organized labor at that time. And it really, it really kind of kicked off uh, organizing uh, nationwide, even though Montana had already started um, uh, well into it. Uh, but it also created a divide within the national labor movement, within the American Federation of Labor itself. Um, because all of a sudden it became legal for workers to organize, everybody was organizing. The American Federation of Labor saw itself as the voice of labor. They liked to organize unions based on craft. All of a sudden you had all of these industrial unions that were cropping up that were clamoring for, for um, admittance into the AFL uh, and so forth. And they were trying to figure out how they were gonna do that and what craft union they were gonna associate them with and so forth. And so a small band of hardy souls created the Committee uh, uh, for Industrial Organization within the AFL. And they just started bringing in everybody. Didn't matter if they had a craft that they could attach to on the national or international um, level, uh, they just wanted them to be added to, uh, uh, added to, the, to the ranks of organized labor. And the CIO was interested in, in how it organized. Um, it, it, it organized industrial. So a perfect example is the auto industry. They had been attempting to organize the auto industry. They weren't having a lot of success with that. So they turned and targeted the rubber industry and the steel industry, and they worked in that direction to organize the entire, the entire industry. Um, there were a few things about the CIO that the upper echelon of the AFL didn't appreciate. One, they were too pushy, too confrontational. Um, they were too militant. And they liked to hire communists as organizers because communists really know, knew how to organize uh, people at that time. Most of the members of the Communist Party, of course, were going out and doing community organizing and things like that. And so it was, it was just a short hop from organizing communities and elections and so forth like that to organizing industries and, and so forth. And again, the labor movement has always had that left of center bent, um, or at least a portion of it has. Uh, and so this was one instance where they really tapped into that. The interesting thing about that was that the gentleman who was the head of the CIO at the time, John Lewis, John L. Lewis, you can't really say his name and leave the L out, can you? John L. Lewis, the United Mine Workers of America, the coal miners, um, really appreciated the work that they did, and he didn't care what party they voted. He was a Republican, they were communists, he just wanted to organize workers. So it didn't matter to him um, where they came from as long as they could work effectively. And Montana was no different um, in uh, their organizing. Um, one, of the, uh, one of the unions that was part of the, uh, the early Committee for Industrial Organization was Mine Mill. So it was early on a CIO union, I guess, if you will. And then uh, East Helena uh, organized the Montana State Industrial Union Council with Sylvester Graham is the president of the organization, and he would remain the president until uh, the Montana State CIO and the Montana Federation of Labor merged in 1956. This is John L. Lewis. Um, and this is actually the charter for the Montana State Industrial Union Council. Uh, a gentleman picked it up in a secondhand store in Butte about three years ago. Um, and uh, you can see that it was signed in 19, they were chartered in 1938. Uh, so CIO unions were a big part of the reorganization of organized labor uh, in Montana, if you will. Um, and as I mentioned, the AFL had a problem with this because one of the things that the CIO began to do early on was attach itself to Roosevelt and the New Deal and the New Deal policies and as such to the Democratic Party. And the American Federation of Labor believed that unions should be autonomous and not be one party or, or the other. Um, they thought that the Wagner, uh, uh, the Wagner Act was unbalanced, that it tipped the scale too far in the favor of labor, which is kind of an interesting um, comment from a, a, a labor federation. 
Um, they believe that the National Labor Relations Board was left-wing and biased. So they ruled too often in favor of, uh, of the workers. And in some respects, this divide in the labor movement itself, at such a crucial time, left a, a window of opportunity open um, that would come back in 1947 with Taft-Hartley. Uh, they also were suspicious of the communists and so forth within the ranks of the, of the CIO. Uh, that made them nervous as well. And you have to remember that the American labor movement, even though it's slightly left of center, has a, a pretty conservative streak to it, in large part, I believe, because of the influence of Samuel Gompers on, on the labor movement. Um, perfect example is the Haymarket riot. Um, the International Labor Community picks May Day as the International Workers Day, and the American labor movement, when it starts accepting a Labor Day in the 1890s and early 1900s, picks the first Sunday in, or the first Monday in September because that's, least, that, that, that's less confrontational than May 1st. So there's that kind of conservative bent that's going on with the AFL that they have to, to come to grips with, and there's no way I'm gonna make it in 50 minutes. Um, and there are other things going on besides the organization of labor. Uh, as I mentioned, the New Deal is going on. Um, there's been a lot of unrest with the, the, the Depression and so forth, and people are trying to get their footing, figure out how to help one another, what the government's role should be in that, and so forth. And so in Montana, one of the things that came about from that was the Pro Progressive Government League. Um, and it came about in 1937, after the 1937 um, legislative session, um, when several laws were passed that, that they took issue with. Uh, one of them was the, uh, the Hitler Law, or House Bill 65, which essentially gave the uh, governor of the state of Montana the right to fire any state employee or appointee to a state commission. It was just kind of a blanket, here you go. You can, you can fire anybody that you want to for any reason that you want to. You don't even have to have a reason. You can just not like the tie that they're wearing that day. Um, and it came about because of uh, the situation that was taking place at the State Board of Examiners, where a couple of individuals on that commission were packing their side of the commission with their, their henchmen. So they thought that this would be a good way to counter that. Some of the liberals, the more liberal individuals uh, in the Democratic Party thought that it was, this would be a good thing to have because it would hold back the power of the Anaconda Company and Montana Power. Obviously, there was some severe opposition to this from a number of fronts, including the Butte uh, Miners Union, uh, Local One. Their president, Robert Brown, um, uh, came out against it, saying that it gave too much uh, power to the governor and it created a political bureaucracy and dictatorship. And so they were extremely suspicious of this bill. It actually passed the legislature and it was signed into law by Governor Roy Ayers. Um, and so it went, on, it went on to the books. I don't know if it was ever used, but it was, it was there. So this Progressive Government uh, League got together and decided that there were several things that they thought that, that we as a country, we as a state should be working on. And it, it, it so amazes me how we just keep doing the same things over and over and over again because we just don't do it. And so one of the first things was, okay, so let's come up with uh, let's come up with a minimum wage law for women. Because women aren't paid the same as men. Let's pay them an equal wage. Um, and I love the quote. Uh, they wanted to, women to get an equal wage for working the same job and enduring the same working conditions. And they thought that by doing this, this would, be, this would be the emancipation of a certain class of workers in a state of almost abject slavery. So 1937, we're still, I mean, we, we're after equal wage for, for women. I mean, that was one of the main things that they wanted to do. They also wanted to establish a progressive newspaper that would report on the activities of the late legislature because the company own newspapers weren't doing that, like the House Bill 65 didn't get any press um, around the state about what it would do and so forth. They wanted collar-to-collar -collar pay for the miners. Um, they wanted uh, 
to unionize the teachers at the university level to prevent the teaching of social sciences and economics that undermine the principles of organized labor. Um, they wanted a resolution to repeal the criminal syndicalism law uh, that was on the books and had been on the books since 1918. Um, no sales tax. Um, and enforcement of the union label for state publications. So it's kind of interesting how they're working on this. I love that flyer, the Hitler bill, the Boodle bill. Um, they even called it the Mussolini bill. <coughs> so as far as the universities go and organizing them to assist organized labor, um, there were a few things going on at the University of Montana that drew the attention of the American Federation of Teachers to the point that they actually did a report on academic freedom at the university. And what they discovered were, was that there were several instances where um, academic freedom was basically stomped on. Um, 1911, 1915, 1919. 1919 was when Professor Levine um, was asked to do a study on the tax situation in Montana to see who and where the tax, tax money was coming from and discovered that the Anaconda Company was woefully underpaying its taxes in the state. And so he got, he got fired. <laughs> um, and that actually led to the creation of the first university um, uh, union uh, at, at the U of M, uh, Local 120 in 1919, 1920, that was in that early newspaper article. Um, Professor Fisher, uh, the one that we're interested in is 1937, Professor Kenny, Keeney. he's a librarian. Um, he was also um, not a fan of who the powers that be wanted to be that wanted to be the new president of the university. Um, and as such, you know, led a campaign against him not being uh, uh, named uh, the professor's name. I just lost it. That's because you got to turn the page. Never print front to back. Um, Simmons, and I don't have a, unfortunately I don't have a first name. So anyhow, uh, Professor Kenny uh, didn't like Simmons, didn't think he was qualified to do the job, and so he was an early advocate for his not getting the appointment. However, Simmons had several supporters from the Missoula Mercantile Company, which was a power in Missoula, um, and there were also a number of Missoula businessmen and alums who also reportedly subsidized the football team that thought Simmons would be good for the university. Uh, so he was, he, was, uh, he was put in as president of the university. Well, one of the first things that he did, and this is why they're rather graphic book cover, um, Vardis Fisher's book, Passion Spin the Plot. Never heard of it. I've read one Vardis Fisher book in my life, and it's called um, Mountain Man and it was kind of a knockoff of Liver Eaton Johnson. Had no idea he wrote Bodice Rippers. <laughs> um, but anyhow, this book came out uh, when Vardis Fisher was in Idaho working for the Federal Writers Project, and um, it was banned. And so Kenny was told to remove it from the shelf, and evidently he had a, a shelf of books up front in the library of new books that came in, and so Fine, you know we have to va we have to ban this one. He just cleared the shelf. Said we'll we'll, we'll ban them all. Um, the university president got mad about that, and so he he wanted to create the committee on quote good taste um, to make sure that student plays were appropriate, uh, that student publications were appropriate, and this kind of thing didn't end up in the university library. Well, it had a short lived. Um, life the committee did before it was, before it was uh, squelched. The other thing that Kenny did was he worked on reorganizing the local at the university. He and a professor named Rowe. Uh, professor Rowe was a geologist who had close to 40 years uh, in at the University of Montana. And he was chairman of the local that was established at the university. And so the university president put him on month-to-month -month tenure. <laughs> 
um, as kind of punishment for, for having the chutzpah to, to establish this local within the university um, where it wasn't needed. Professor Kenny was just given an unpaid sabbatical. You go away, clean up your act, you might be able to come back, you might not be able to. They actually, he actually took him to court and won and, and uh, returned to the university. The local, again, had a short lifespan before it went out again. Uh, interesting enough, Mike Mansfield served as the treasurer of that local when it was opened in 37. Um, and it wouldn't be resurrected until the 60s and 70s. I'm not quite sure of the date on that. So there were a lot of things going on. Five minutes? You're kidding me. You guys want me to do a part two, right? <laughs> yeah? Okay. Whew. Okay. So um, another thing that I found fascinating about this time period, 1937, is that we're, we are in the Depression. The New Deal is trying to put uh, people to work. We have the Federal Writers Project, which is part of the WPA, um, to put those unemployed writers and historians and librarians and so forth to work because they need to work as much as anybody else. And so they started producing these guidebooks um, for each state, territory, so forth. Montana's came out in 1937 and immediately ran afoul of Representative Martin Dyes from Texas and his House Un-American Activities Committee. Yes, there was one before Joe, before McCarthy. Um, and he looked at the guidebook for Montana and decided, wow, this has got some, this has got some nasty stuff in it. And one of his investigators asserted that there was communist propaganda in the Minnesota, Montana, and New Jersey guidebooks. Um, and uh, so that they should be pulled from publication and not published until that information was cleaned up. So th the interesting thing is that the, the paper did publish an excerpt that they found objectionable in the guidebook that spoke to that kind of communist influence, and I'm going to read it here to you. In the face of great exertions made by corporate power in civic affairs, Montanans have been sympathetic to labor's point of view and inclined to support candidates and policies that seem to promise something in the way of betterment for the common people. They have been prone to consider and try out experiments and have given at least temporary support to many an ism. A few of these they have retained, adopted, and made workable. Obviously, that's a communist threat. <laughs> Dice Committee was established to weed out communists and infiltrators, obviously, into the government, and members of the American Bund, which was the kind of German-American, did I pronounce that right, Bonnie? Bund, B-U-N-D? Um, the German um, fascist, German-American fascist group in the United States. He spent more time with communists. He, he, he liked the communists. So they went after the guidebook and they blocked publication of it for um, a number of months before it finally came out. Uh, the other thing that Dyes was concerned about was the CIO because in 1937 the AFL expelled seven unions from their ranks. Um, because they wouldn't stop organizing industrial uh, unions. It wasn't because they were communists that just they wouldn't stop they, they wouldn't stop organizing industrial unions. So they created the Congress of Industrial Organizations, and this is where John Lewis start John L. Lewis started hiring the communists and all that kind of good stuff. And so these are references to the sit down strikes that are happening in the rubber industry and the steel industry and all of that kind of good stuff that Dyes and his committee are worried about. And they're worried about the communists and the industrial, um, uh, and the CIO at this time. I'm trying to figure out how I'm gonna put a wrap on this. <sighs> you, you're, you're, you're killing me. <laughs> Lumber and sawmill workers, yep. Associated Industries, Perry Melton, Union Thug, looks like a professor. Um, Labor, Taft-Hartley. What I found interesting, and I'll, I'll stop here. <laughs>
What I found interesting was looking at some of the acts that were passed on the federal level that were targeted to communists. One of the things that was used in Taft-Hartley was an affidavit saying that you were not a member of the Communist Party or did not have, were, or did not have a membership. Um, Montana tried to mirror some of that. An act defining, well, in 1919, this is the criminal syndicalism law and so forth. This would stay on the books until 73. Um, 1951, the registration of certain societies, corporations, and so forth. Uh, <laughs> the interesting thing about this is they wanted subversive organizations to register. They had a, f <laughs> they, they had a four-man committee. They went to Butte to meet with the local FBI to find out who the communists were that they needed to get registered, and the FBI agent told them there are no communists in Montana. <laughs> so they went back to their motel room and on a 3-1 vote decided to disband the committee. 1953, and we'll stop here, um, they had a resolution to create an interim committee uh, for, that was called the Montana Un-American uh, Committee, MUC. It's a great name. Let me see, find the slide. There we go, MUC. And so a representative out of Lake County um, um, came up with this statement that the state had a serious red problem and it needed to be taken care of. And so this com committee, um, and the representative's name was Weedem, Weedman, and he and his committee were going to weed out the communists from the state. The interesting thing is, is even though it passed the legislature and passed through the governor and so forth, they failed to appropriate any money for it. So he didn't have money to meet, have his committee meeting. Even though... The Billingses, Harry and Gretchen, in the People's Voice, advertised for folks to send any spare change that they had to him so that they could meet. <laughs> um, so that's kind of amusing. So it's, it, it's interesting to see how this labor and communism thing go hand in hand up through the 50s um, and essentially begins to pull apart organized, uh, organized labor um, to the point that we are today, the end. Invite me back. Let me finish. <laughs> I got some great wonder stuff. You're killing me. We will absolutely have to have Rich back to, to give that second half uh, more um, slowly. Uh, but do come back next week in the meantime for Montana during the relocation and termination era. And I'm sure Rich will stay around to answer a few questions for people if you have them. But we're going to um, let folks go. This is the end of the formal presentation, and thank you so much, Rich. <laughs>